we welcome you to worship at Prairie Avenue Christian Church in Decatur, Illinois. Prairie Avenue Christian Church welcomes those who are single or married, divorced or engaged, whatever gender identification or sexual orientation. We welcome the filthy rich, dirt poor, or no habla ingles. We also welcome those who are crying newborns, old as dirt, skinny as a rail, or could afford to lose a few pounds. We welcome you if you are dressed to the nines or have only the shirt on your back. We welcome anyone who can sing like Stevie Wonder or who can't carry a tune in any sized bucket. You are welcome here if you are just browsing, just woke up, or just got out of jail. We don't care if you are holier than Swiss cheese or haven't been in church since your nephew's baptism 20 years ago. We welcome soccer moms, NASCAR dads, starving artists, tree huggers, latte sippers, nose pickers, tax collectors, veterans, vegetarians, and junk food junkies. If you blew all your offering money at the gaming parlor, you are welcome here. If you are inked, pierced, or both, you are in the right place. If you are in recovery or still addicted, we are happy to see you. We welcome you because we have experienced the thrill of being welcomed by God. We were once a mess, but God willingly welcomed us through the cross-stretched arms of Jesus. He gave his life so we could experience real life and be part of his forever family. God is delighted to see you here, and we at Prairie Avenue Christian Church are too. Welcome to worship today.
Gather us, O God, into the household of grace, the fold of your love. We recognize your holy presence and are turned to toward a new day by the rising of the light of Christ. Help us to face this day and all of our days with the hope and promise made full for us in the person of Jesus Christ as we unite ourselves with him once more and receive his heavenly food. For these and all of our prayers, we lift to you in his name. Amen. Let us pray. Center us now, O God, on your presence in this place among your people, as we lift up our heart's desires, our soul's deep needs, our hungers, fears, and failures. As we have often failed to be obedient to your will in our lives as individual disciples and as church, we pray that you will forgive us and enliven us to be and to do the gospel of Christ. Open us to your Spirit's urgings and awaken us to live faithfully as your people in a changing, often hurting world. We pray for those around us who need your care and ask that you would make of us your instruments of healing, peace, and redemption. We pray especially for those we have named to you this day and others we lift to you in the silence of our hearts.
God, you have made each of us with gifts to express and continually call us to discover and use them as we fulfill our vocations in communion with you for the common good. Make us aware of your calling in our lives and help us to find creative ways in which to use our gifts to fulfill your calling so that in all of our labors we may glorify you. As we give thanks to you for the work to which you have called us and the opportunities you have provided for us to earn a living, we pray for those who are unemployed or underemployed and who struggle to find their way forward in a difficult time. Help us to help them with the compassion and encouragement we find in Christ Jesus. Reveal your presence with all of those for whom we pray, and with us, God of life, that as people of renewed faith and vitality, we may be empowered to serve your world, and so give glory to you. For we offer our prayers and our lives in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit now and forever. Amen. Our first reading today comes to us from the book of Ezekiel, chapter 33, verses 7 through 11. So you, mortal, I have made a sentinel for the house of Israel. Whenever you hear a word from my mouth, you shall give them warning from me. If I say to the wicked, O wicked ones, you shall surely die and you do not speak to warn the wicked to turn from their ways. The wicked shall die in their iniquity, but their blood I will require at your hand. But if you warn the wicked to turn from their ways, and they do not turn from their ways, the wicked shall die in their iniquity, but you will have saved your life. Now you, mortal, say to the house of Israel, Thus you have said, Our transgressions and our sins weigh upon us, and we waste away because of them. How then can we live? Say to them, As I live, says the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from their ways and live. Turn back, turn back from your evil ways, for why will you die, O house of Israel? Our gospel reading today comes to us from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 18, verses 15 through 20. If another member of the church sins against you, go and point out the fault when the two of you are alone. If the member listens to you, you have regained that one. But if you are not listened to, take one or two others along with you, so that every word may be confirmed by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If the member refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if the offender refuses to listen even to the church, let such a one be to you as a Gentile, and a tax collector. Truly I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, truly I tell you, if two of you agree on earth about anything you ask, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there among them. Most irreconciled conflicts in life were first conceived when someone refused to speak to the other about the matter or the concern in a manner that utilized face-to-face, -face, direct communication, respectful discretion between the two parties, 
mutual accountability for both, and an ongoing dialogue. Most of the world's problems start from a failure to speak freely to one another, one to one. No, whether it's a conference or a phone call or at a family reunion, no, we would rather hold our secret meetings, calling all other members who we suspect may share our concern or join our cause and write that wonderful correspondence of the unsigned anonymous letter outlining a whole list of grievances and presented by a representative requesting that first formal meeting and to have, in the church's case, a regional minister present to speak about these concerns. Or the other tactic used is to speak casually to the minister just before worship with the official first sign of displeasure. Some people are deeply concerned. Last I look, and believe me, it takes a while to look through them all, but because we have over 2,300 names in the Prairie Avenue membership roll book since 1924, and to be granted, more than 1,200 of them are now deceased. I have not found anywhere in our membership roles uh, the record of some people being baptized or a person named some people transferring their membership here or even joining this congregation. Yet, there, these people must be the most important members of this congregation since they seem to generate so much interest when they are deeply concerned. They must truly be sentinels of the community, warning us with such solemn drama and intrigue. If you've ever been around a church, you may have heard some of these concerns from some people. We did not know you were going to be out of town on vacation. We do not have enough input in what goes into the newsletter or bulletin. You are not calling on someone who last attended worship in 1972. They have not given any financial contributions since 1989, but feel that you're not doing the job properly. I have not heard my favorite hymn since I only attend twice a year. Can you turn the organ down? Can you turn the organ up? I don't want to watch a TV in the sanctuary. I want to watch a TV in the sanctuary. While it's a common joke that families leave often because the color of the parlor carpet has changed or the type of hymnal we are or are not using. It is more common for church conflict to erupt when simply a group of members or former members feel that they are losing both power and control over the staff, over bylaws, over influence. Not suggesting in any way new ways for the church to be more nimble, relevant, and flexible they're just making sure that the informal power structures that they rely upon are saved at all costs. 
we begin today a new exploration of what it means to love our enemies. And we often believe conflict is some means or form of betrayal. Certainly when conflict is only used to keep power and control, it is. But life experience also teaches us that some resistance in life can also lead to new insights as well as personal growth. There have been those times in my own life where when challenged, it has improved the circumstances. We need gravity to stay well-footed. If we didn't have resistance like that, we would literally float off into space. We need those experiences that teach us the better methods, the better responses, and draw out the better outcomes in life. Conflict, regardless of what you have heard, is not necessarily always bad. It is how it is handled and how it is used that makes a difference. Our reading today in Ezekiel reminds us of the value of one who is watching for us. A sentinel in Israel was one who would sound an instrument when danger was approaching, when the warning would change the outcome, when we could prepare ourselves for what was coming. The warning is given for when we fail to be responsible with God's message, a call to rethink, to reconsider, to reexamine. The scripture reminds us that Israel's lamenting, it no longer listens, not because God will not forgive Israel, but rather because Israel will not open its ears to hear God's mercy extended to their sin. They feel it's too great, too overwhelming for even God's mercy. And too often in life, instead of stepping into another's bad behavior, we excuse ourselves. When we step away from mercy, God warns us, without held mercy will be the consequence of the one who should have given the warning. Often God's warnings to us is the true nature of our behavior and action, the shortcomings that we refuse to identify and the consequences that we have failed to see. Ezekiel reminds us that God is not on this whole kick of having the desire to lose anyone, but that we indeed have a responsibility to one another to not only listen to the music of heaven, but also to hear the laments of the earth. We should have our hearts and minds break for the things in life that break God's heart. Our reading from the Gospel of Matthew encounters Jesus instructing on what cross-bearing and life-losing looks and acts like in a life-giving pattern driven by love, humility, and generosity. He's offering a community-saving way to deal with conflict rather than the well-worn pathway of death. In conflict. So what does death dealing conflict look like? Well, first of all, at the very beginning, there's the temptation to avoid or evade the conflict, to disappear, to leave without telling anyone. And second, then there's the temptation to gossip, it, gossip, to tell other people about the person or the behavior that is so criminal to you. No, it's not telling the person who did it, it's telling other people about it. Third, there's the temptation to gang up on each other, recruiting like-minded people to accept 
our version of the events, our interpretation, and to create this echo chamber of grievance and, oh, yes, how awful, and, oh, yeah, he's done that before. Oh, that is just wrong. And fourth, the temptation to air that grievance to our pre-selected biased echo chamber audience, people who already agree with us to reinforce the agreement in our interpretation. Fifth, the temptation to regard the now opponents as if they are unwelcome or better off elsewhere. If you don't like it, you can just leave. So, just again, to cover the path of and timeline of conflict handling badly done, you do not tell the person or the group about your concern or issue. You tell someone else about your concern who's not involved in the issue. You gather a group of like-minded people, again, who were not involved in the issue to repeat your interpretation, and then you repeat that grievance to the group that already agrees with your interpretation, and then you lead a campaign to dismiss or force a resignation. It's happened time and time again. What I think I just described, when I think about it a little deeper, is the whole conception and delivery of every divisive Facebook meme and vainglorious world of social media fame shame culture. This path lives and breathes on simply three things, being popular, being affirmed, and having everyone agree with you, and expelling those who do not. What this costs is community, fellowship, and reconciliation, the possibility of which is beyond it when the person first gossips. So what does something like this look like? Well, it, it looks like some people are concerned and would like to meet with you about an issue that occurred six months ago and will determine your continued employment. Or more simply, I am right, you are wrong, and I would like to talk to you about it. It doesn't have to be this way. Jesus reminds us that conflict will happen and conflict should be faced squarely and wisely and it should always be framed first by mercy, not winning. The steps that Jesus outlined are not magical and to be honest, they may not fit in every situation, but they fit most situations. There are some situations where separation may be the best and only solution. The best resolution and dismissal may be required. But with Jesus even saying as the last possible act of treating someone like a tax collector or a Gentile, one must remember how Jesus treated tax collectors and Gentiles, how he treated all outsiders of his group. One tax collector became an apostle. And his last command to his followers before he ascended into heaven were to go and make disciples of all nations. Not some nations, not the ones that like you, but all nations. No one and no group is out of reach to respond with offered grace or demonstrated love. Interestingly, 
this outline on conflict management occurs between two parables about lost sheep and the unforgiving servant, those two parables. Both parables are about regaining the one who has strayed, the one who has wandered, and finds themselves in need of mercy and care. In the story of the unforgiving servant, unfortunately, too often extravagant forgiveness for ludicrous debts usually results in the very next step being conceded withholding of forgiveness in small injustices. Those who have been forgiven much may have a heart that forgives little. Prairie Avenue does have a conflict resolution policy that is modeled from this twofold path of both direct communication and the intention to fully reconcile the differences, misunderstandings, and conflicts that are bound to happen between different people, different opinions, and different interpretations. The policy gives us the guideposts to assure both parties of a process, a due process present when necessary or needed. But it would be awfully tempting to take this list that Jesus offers us as a checkoff list, like a Miranda Wright statement. Did we Matthew 18 eyes it? But imagine, if you will, that, that there was a group of committed Christians who constantly sought and demonstrated this two-way pathway of communication and reconciliation. All actions do have ripple effects, and churches have learned too well the path towards excommunication and expulsion rather than inclusion and acceptance. Our denominational map is the heaven and earth breaking policy and reality of evasion, avoidance, and recruitment of like minded and like thinking, and the wrong concept that life is just simply better without having a contrarian in it. So when you are hurt, even angry at the omissions or commissions of others, what will you do? Which path will you choose? And when you have hurt someone, whether by honest mistake or deliberate intention, what will you do? What path will you choose? In a world that is filled with all forms of communication, it is still best. The number one way to communicate is still directly to the person or the people who have created who have created and can also change that situation. Again, Jesus reminds us that the goal is not to expel, but to regain the person who may be lost if this is not resolved. It may not be solved to everyone's satisfaction. It may not even come to an agreement but it can come to that valuable thing of accepting. And when we deliberate on life together, we can demonstrate God's purpose and will towards reconciling, towards liberation, towards justice and healing, and the life-changing work of repairing our broken world. With a phone call, an appointment, a cafe meeting, a step into the due process of love that may just regain what is potentially an enemy into a lifelong friend and a path where both tax collectors and Gentiles of our own time and places extend never ending love and grace. Amen.
Mark Sandlin once said that after close study, I have concluded that Jesus believed that there are two kinds of people. Your neighbors, whom you are supposed to love, and your enemies, whom you are supposed to love. Unfortunately, sometimes our neighbors feel like enemies. But what if we could see our enemies as our neighbors? We're always looking for the exception to the rule. And for most cases with Jesus, it's not a case that his instructions fail us. It's because we fail to even try to follow the instructions we've already been given. I can think of a failing in our family history. You see, there was some setback in the care of my great grandmother back in the 1960s before I was even born. And it was a, a fight between my grandfather and his older sisters. Honestly, so many years have passed that no one knows exactly what started it, but it seems to have involved her residing in a nursing home and certain gifts being given to her while she stayed there. Now, did my grandfather's sisters reach out and talk to their younger brother about this situation? No. Instead, they sought power of attorney to protect their beloved mother from one of, his, uh, one of her own children, signing documents that apparently she did not fully understand, but gave them the power to restrict who would see her. There's a sad tale my mother shares of trying to visit her grandmother where she's escorted off the premises. Many of the sisters claim to be good Christians. Usually the ones who claim to be Christians tend to have behavior that tells you no. And this one act of failing to even talk to one another led to hang up phone calls or opening lines as I still remember them. Phyllis, this is Jimmy's sister, Ruby. Don't hang up. Visiting with the extended family of my grandfather is a unique experience when we gather for funerals. I remember one cousin coming up and going, I know I'm supposed to hate you, but I honestly don't know why. Jesus reminds us in stark terms that this is heaven and earth breaking when we fail to resolve our conflicts. Frankly, this rupture in my family has been with us for 50 years. Whatever the grievance was is long forgotten. Whoever was involved in the act is long dead, and yet the legacy remains. I don't know what long-term family feud is going on in your life, but you probably have the power to end it today. Whether it is calling one-to-one, -one, whether it's writing a note, please sign it to say, maybe I misunderstood something long ago. I never told you this, but I'm looking that maybe this can be resolved. 
and I'm willing to, to take the act of seeking forgiveness or extending mercy so that this burden no longer impacts heaven or earth. Because the one thing about wounds, whether they are physical, emotional, psychological, is that if they're never treated, they never heal properly. the ointment of direct communication, the salve of accountability may be just what the great physician ordered for your life. Will you continue to self-medicate or will you let the great physician heal. One way will extend life. The other will take it away. It may just take the phone call saying, I'm sorry. or the letter that says, I ask for your mercy. I did not know. Heaven and earth are waiting, watching what you will do.
It is interesting how food plays such an important role in the most significant events in the Bible. In today's reading from Exodus, the Israelites are given specific instructions on how to prepare and eat the lamb that will ensure their deliverance from slavery in Egypt. This meal is so significant that God commands them to celebrate this as a festival throughout the generations. Of course, it was at a Passover feast that another important symbolic meal took place, the one we have remembered for over 2,000 years and still remember today. In both meals, a sacrifice is made so that those who partake will know the freedom God's love offers. Through this bread and cup, we are freed from the power of sin and death and offered the gift of new life through the love of Christ. I do not know what holds you down, but each of us has something that binds us and keeps us from knowing God more fully. These elements are the keys that unlock those chains for us and sets us free to live the abundant life Jesus offers. Unlike the Passover meal, the instructions here are quite simple. Take and eat. Take a drink. Remember. Let us share in communion together. Let us pray. O oh God, your grace exceeds our highest expectations, hopes, and dreams. You have given bread for not only those who love and follow you, but indeed enough for all your children. As we break this bread, may we receive it as the body of Christ who gives himself that we might know your abundant presence in our lives. As we bless this cup, May all who receive it as his blood know the forgiveness of sin and the renewal to life everlasting, far greater than we could ever ask or imagine. May we all be bound together as your family through the love and self-giving of Jesus the Christ. And now, with the confidence of your children, we offer the prayer our Savior taught us, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
for those who are regular attenders and members of Prairie Avenue Christian Church, we thank you for your generosity and support of the work and ministries of the church. If you are a regular attender or member of another church, we encourage you to support financially your home congregation or church. If you would like to contribute to the ministries of Prairie Avenue Christian Church, you can do so using our donate page on our website. If you've never done it before, it is fairly straightforward to figure out. You may also drop your offering in the mail. The church's address is 2201 East Prairie, Decatur, Illinois 62521. If you have any questions, you can call the church office at 217 217- 428-3327. We hope our worship service has blessed you in your faith journey today. And thank you for your generous support. You are prepared to walk away from the darkness and into the light. Go into this world confident in Christ's love and God's eternal presence with you. Go to be a witness for good and a bearer of peace to all you meet. Go in peace. Amen.